morning, everyone, and welcome to our monthly Breakfast with O'Keefe program. I'm Katrina Latka, Curator of Education and Interpretation at the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum. I would like to begin by recognizing the lands of the Pueblo people on which the sites of the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum stand. We recognize and honor their elders, past and present, and celebrate the vitality of their people today and into, past, into future generations. I offer this with humility and gratitude in acknowledgement of the need to confront the ongoing injustices of settler colonialism. Now for some Zoom housekeeping. If you've not already done so, please introduce yourself in the chat box. To find the chat, please go to the bottom of your screen and click on chat. If you're using an iPad, the chat can be found at the top of your screen. The chat box will then appear when you click on chat. Above where you type your message, you will have the op option to send a message to everyone or to the panelists. Please also utilize the chat box for questions throughout the presentation and our presenter, Chloe Glass, will answer a selection at the end. You can close the chat box by clicking on the X in the upper right-hand corner. If the chat box is in the middle of your screen, you can move it around your screen by clicking on it and holding down your mouse button and dragging it around. Closed captioning is also available. To turn it on, click on the CC button on your screen, which is located either at the bottom or the top, depending on your device. I would like to also extend a thank you to our members and donors who are here today. Your support made this event possible. If you're not yet a member and you enjoy this program, please consider joining today. Visit gokm.org slash membership to learn more. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter this morning, Chloe Glass. Chloe is a Yale College History of Art major and Education Studies scholar. She has worked as a gallery guide at the Yale University Art Gallery since 2017, designing and leading over 45 collections-based highlights tours. For the past year, Glass has been writing her History of Art thesis on Georgia O'Keeffe's 1971 print Save Our Planet, Save Our Air in the Yale Art Gallery's collection. Her research is one of the first to in investigate this print, the larger Save Our Planet series, and place O'Keeffe's work in the context of American environmentalism and cultural diplomacy in the 1970s. Her other extracurricular activities include leading week-long hiking trips across New England, for incoming students for Yale's first year outdoor orientation trips program or FOOT and actively contributing to FOOT's public land educational program. She has also led the Yale Women's Water Polo Club team as captain. So without further delay, Chloe Glass. Welcome, Chloe. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, before I begin, I would also like to acknowledge the lands I'm speaking from. So today, I'm speaking to you from New Haven, Connecticut, which are the lands of the Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill Pogusset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac and other Algonquin speaking peoples. Yale University is also built on this stolen indigenous land and with the labor of enslaved black and indigenous individuals. So as you're introducing yourselves in the chat, I encourage you to use the link I'm going to drop to find out whose lands you are on. All right, now I will share my screen. So um, as Katrina mentioned, I have worked as a gallery guide at the Yale Art Gallery since 2017, creating these collections-based tours. And this is really how I came to know O'Keeffe. I included her portrait of this steer skull on my first tour in 2017 and have included it on every tour since. It's one of my favorite works at the gallery. And this past year, I took a gap year, uh, during which time I researched uh, this print, in which I'm standing next to in the Yale Art Gallery's collection called Save Our Planet, Save Our Air. I'm really looking forward to talking with you all today about this work, especially as it has, uh, it's very under-researched, and I'm, my work places O'Keeffe at the intersection of cultural diplomacy and environmentalism. As October is also Archives Month, I will share my research process with you all, and it's still ongoing. 
I'd also like to thank my professors, Dr. Jennifer Rabb and Dr. Ned Cook, as well as Yale Art Gallery curator, Mark Mitchell, and of course, those at the O'Keeffe Museum, including Director Hartley, Liz Ernst, um, Shannon Bay, and Katrina, who have been so supportive and enthusiastic of my research. Thank you. So this print by O'Keeffe was published in 1971 as part of an anti-pollution poster series that included works by other famous American artists, including Roy Lichtenstein and Alexander Calder. The series was organized by Jean Lipman, editor of the magazine Art in America and director of the Whitney Museum's publications. Luckily, many of Jean Lipman's archives were available online through, through the Smithsonian Museum of American Art, and these documents were really instrumental as they provided me with much primary material um, and about Lipman's conception of the Save Our Planet series. However, no research uh, really existed on O'Keeffe's print or this series. So for the first few months, I concentrated on reading uh, the existing literature surrounding O'Keeffe, learning more about her time spent living in New Mexico and the reoccurring motifs in her work. Through this background reading, I found that this print utilized one of O'Keeffe's earlier compositions called Sky Above Clouds II from 1963. Sky Above Clouds II was part of an ongoing uh, series from the 1960s. From clockwise on the top left, we have the first uh, painting from 1962, and then moving uh, around the screen to the bottom left-hand corner is the final uh, work in that series, Sky Above Clouds IV from 1965. We can really see O'Keeffe turning to abstraction in this series as she moves from these kind of loosely shaped clouds in 1962 to a more uniform uh, shape that fills the horizon as far as the eye can see in the, 19, in the late 1960s. You also might be most familiar with Sky Above Clouds number four, as it was O'Keeffe's largest work at 24 feet long and eight feet tall, and is now in the Art Institute of Chicago. O'Keeffe began taking plane rides across the American Southwest in the 1950s, and in letters to her friends, she recalls, quote, it makes me feel like flying. So Sky Above Clouds 2 really communicates O'Keeffe's awe at this landscape. The pure white clouds absent of any gray smog stretch endlessly towards a rising sun, imparting a view of the sky that is clean and hopeful. However, at the time, air pollution was widely prevalent in the US. Jean Littman herself received a letter from someone who expressed the anxiety about the pollution in New York, and Littman's assistant also referenced the dangerous air quality in the city, writing, quote, I'm sure it comes as no surprise to you that many artists feel passionately about that issue at the moment, particularly those working in the New York and Los Angeles area. A poster program by well-known artists could be a dramatic and effective way of launching an artist's campaign for conservation, end quote. Littman was thus eager to leverage O'Keeffe's idyllic aerial landscape to communicate a message of anti-pollution efforts. The blurb that accompanied O'Keeffe's print in press releases read, certainly the most famous American woman painter, Georgia O'Keeffe has made her life and work in the tiny village of Abiq, New Mexico, a celebration of nature in its purest state. In recent years, inspired by air travel, she has created a great series of sky paintings. This poster, like the paintings, is dedicated to the beauty of serene, unpolluted skies. So again, highlighting this idea of uh, the air as, as pure, as uh, unpolluted. However, translating uh, a painting into a poster asks the question of scale in particular. Um, these two archival images from the O'Keeffe Museum's collection depict O'Keeffe standing in front of Sky Above Clouds 2 in 1965, and then the painting hanging on the wall of O'Keeffe's sitting room in Abiq. The photos really give us a sense of the large scale of the painting. We feel as if we might be able to step right into this aerial landscape. And so when translating, when trying to think about how to translate this painting into a, a poster, Littman's archives really reveal uh, her thought process. In particular, um, Littman's first draft presented in an idea of the Save Our Planet, Save Our Air poster in this vertical composition with the slogan, uh, at the top, separated from O'Keeffe's signature, which was placed at the bottom. Lippmann's handwritten notes also provide uh, aesthetic directions that inform the aim of the print. She writes, quote, signature and type, so slogan, in same color to relate name and message, signifying the importance of the connection between the artist, O'Keeffe, and the message, clean air. 
Littman also discusses the materiality of the print. She says, best might be best might to get O'Keefe to let us interpret her cloud painting as silkscreen under her direction, which really points to the collaboration between the two and O'Keefe's level of involvement. And if anyone can read that uh, handwritten word at the bottom, please let me know because I can't read it yet. Um, so ultimately the final version of the print, which is in the bottom right hand corner, placed the slogan below the clouds. The typography also changed from solid block letters in Lippmann's draft to these bubble letters, which, and these bubble letters visually paralleled the airiness and emptiness of the clouds themselves. The slogan is also decentered and moved to the left in order to make space for O'Keefe's um, signature, highlighting again this connection between the message and the artist. And with the signature coming on the right-hand side, it almost reads, save our planet, save our air, almost reads as a direct quote from O'Keefe herself. In fact, Littman gathered together five other American artists to promote messages of conservation. So clockwise from the top left, architect Buckminster Fuller, uh, save our cities, painter Roy Lichtenstein, save our water, Photographer Edward Steichen, Save Our Wilderness. Painter O'Keefe, of course, Save Our Air. Sculptor Ernest Trova, Save Our People. And sculptor Alexander Calder, Save Our Wildlife. The typography and placement of the slogan is different on each of these prints, showing that Lippmann worked closely, most likely with some collaboration from the artist, to create a specific design that paralleled the visual iconography of the artist's work. For example, the slogan, Save Our Wildlife, appears handwritten and emerges from the mouth of this fantastical creature in a bubble, almost as if this beast is speaking directly to viewers and, and imploring them to save it. Furthermore, there's no uh, visual similarity among these posters, a, apart from the shared message of Save Our Planet. This is because Lippmann was really specifically leveraging the recognizable aesthetics or themes of each of these famous American artists in order to communicate this message of conservation. For example, Roy Lichtenstein's um, Save Our Water print uses his Band-Aid dots for which he'd become famous. And Edward Steichen had photographed this tree for years and it was a, a specific part of his of. Ernest Trova also um, reused this theme of falling man in his sculptures and paintings. And Buckminster Fuller was well known for his geodesic domes, which we can see here covering a part of, of Manhattan. So these deliberate aesthetic choices really hint to the larger purpose of the series, um, which was diplomatic. And in fact, Lippmann presented signed and numbered sets of the Save Our Planet series to members of the United Nations. She said that the series was intended to, quote, publicize an urgent international message about our entire planet. In this way, the works themselves function as ambassadors, disseminating the message of environmental protection to leaders across the globe. Littman here on the left-hand side is presenting sets of um, posters to um, an administrator of the Environmental Administration in New York. And the series was also sponsored by an Italian print company, Olivetti, whose administrators in this newspaper photograph from 1972 are gifting uh, Roy Lichtenstein's Save Our Water print to the governor of Texas. This was also not the first time that uh, O'Keeffe's work had been used as a message of propaganda. In 1946, O'Keeffe's work had been included in, a in an exhibition titled Advancing American Art that was coordinated by the American federal government. The exhibition was intended as a kind of anti-communist propaganda by exhibiting the works in Latin, Ameri Latin American and Eastern European countries um, and contrasting the modern American works with more traditional socialist realist art. An editor of Magazine of Art wrote that the works in this 1946 exhibition were stunning and lively ambassadors for America. So Littman's series is drawing on this history of using modern American art and especially O'Keeffe's work as international ambassadors. Now that we have a little bit more context about the purpose of the series, we can reanalyze O'Keeffe's print, in particular, the typography. So these bubble letters are positioned at the bottom of the page and they fade into the background as they are the same color as the paper. 
And the fact that they're placed at the bottom and they kind of uh, fade, fade away really foregrounds O'Keeffe's cloud composition and this vision of clean air. Furthermore, the print does not provide any instructions beyond the slogan. World leaders are free to interpret, save our planet, save our air, however they may wish, just as um, the bubble letters are literally made of empty space. The typography also resembles the font of Star Wars, um, as the 1970s really saw an explosion of science fiction stories. So there's kind of a contradiction here in that O'Keeffe's print is intended to communicate uh, an urgent plea uh, to, to protect our planet, but using a font that references fantastical dystopian science fiction narratives. However, even thinking about that contradiction, we can see that Lippmann is really drawing on people's curiosity as they expand their gaze outwards and upwards to the sky. So encouraging them to look above them and also perhaps to help make the invisible air into a more visible and tangible uh, goal. Lippmann also drew on other popular visual iconography from, um, from the time, including these other environmental campaigns from the 1970s. On the left-hand side is an ad for the first Earth Day event in 1970. And this event really gathered together more than 20 million Americans um, who marched for environmental protections. One of the Earth Day organizers remarked on the event the effect remarked on the effect the event had in galvanizing Americans to care for the earth. He said, quote, in late 1969, had you asked the question, what do you think about the environment? I think the most common response would have been, what is the environment? It just didn't have any kind of political connotation to it at all. By midway through 1970, something like 80% of Americans said that they were environmentalists, end quote. So Lippmann is really drawing on this surge of public attention towards the environment uh, when publishing the series in 1971. Lippmann even reused a slogan from a stamp campaign published that, that same year. These four stamps at the top of the page um, also have a two-part slogan with an image of the earth on the left-hand side and then referencing a specific facet of the environment on the right-hand side, whether it be cities, air, soil, or water. Lippmann actually wrote to the Postmaster General in Washington, D.C. in 1970, inquiring after the artists and how to create stamps. Um, this correspondence was in her archive uh, among the material for the 1971 poster series. So Lippmann, as I mentioned, not only reused the slogan, but also the same visual motifs. Here, Buckminster Fuller's Save Our Cities print shares many qualities uh, with the stamp, um, such as the dome here. It's a dome on a playground over which children are playing on. And Buckminster Fuller's print, it's this kind of geodesic dome that covers Manhattan almost as if a force field. The, um, and we also have a reference to the cities again with the skyscrapers rising up from the background on the stamp and on the right hand side Buckminster Fuller's poster presenting a bird's eye view of uh, Manhattan and, and the skyscrapers there. These visual themes interestingly are repeated not only in posters from the 1970s but also in contemporary uh, messages of conservation. So this is a poster from 2020 illustrating ideals for the Green New Deal. And again, we have this bird's eye view of Manhattan covered by a dome, except in this case, uh, it's a green dome built of trees, kind of again, pointing to this image of uh, a clean environment, clean air, clean cities, and which is really, really reminiscent of Buckminster Fuller's uh, 1971 print. Another example from Lippmann's archives was the Dirty Pictures Contest of 1970, which asked Americans to submit works of art highlighting the environment, um, highlighting the environment. And the majority of submissions received depicted really harrowing and frightening images. 
um, as you can see here, there's a man who's crawling through water, almost drowning. And uh, many of the images also depicted smokestacks billowing uh, smog into the air or children's lunch boxes packed with uh, oxygen tanks alongside sandwiches and composition notebooks. So pointing to this image of kind of a devastated um, earth um, if, if collective action is not taken. The Earth Day ad also points to this grim future, discussing the, quote, disease that has infected our countries. The text um, continues and reads, it has brought smog to Yosemite, dumped garbage in the huts and sprayed DDT in our food and left our cities in decay. And so really pointing to the harmful effects of pollution that have already occurred and that will continue to, to occur um, due to a man's actions. However, in contrast to these somber images, Littman really actively orients the Save Our Planet series to present a more optimistic vision of the future, one in which collective action is taken um, and has been taken to prevent the harmful effects of pollution. Littman herself wrote of the series, quote, I've also found it invigorating to realize that this project has represented a positive and forward-looking concept in these days of so many negative and dead-end attitudes in the art world. Oops, I'm so sorry. Um, we can also compare Littman series to the contemporary conservation campaigns and thinking about audience and positionality, which is to say that the Earth Day ad and the Dirty Pictures contest really orient themselves towards an American audience. The Earth Day ad specifically points to American landmarks such as Yosemite, uh, the Hudson and the Pacific, while Dirty Pictures contest receives submissions from Americans only. In contrast, the Save Our Planet series, with the exception perhaps of Buckminster Fuller's depiction of Manhattan, presents subjects that are not tied to a specific location or place. This again highlights the diplomatic purpose of the series as the prints were gifted to members of the United Nations to enact a global consciousness about conservation efforts. Furthermore, rather than asking members of the public or politicians to combat pollution as a whole, as the Earth Day ad and Dirty Pictures did, Lippmann separated environmental concerns into separate aspects. Um, so air, cities, people, water, wildlife, and wilderness. In so doing, these six categories created more manageable demands of foreign politicians. Lippmann wrote, quote, after having worked with the Save Our Planet posters during the past year, I'm really delighted with each one as an exciting individual graphic and with the series as a collective measure. The project was also a truly cooperative venture to produce and present a series of posters whose common denominator is the positive belief that our planet must and can be saved. And I think this, this quote, again, really, really highlights her, her attitude towards um, the series, she's using words such as exciting and collective and a uh, positive belief that our planet must and can be saved. So she's enacting this kind of language of diplomacy and presenting a series of posters that present a, a hopeful view of, of a future environment in which uh, we've worked together to, to take action. Seven years later in 1978, Apparently, Greenpeace actually approached O'Keefe asking to use one of her landscapes of a mountain and lake view for a poster series. Um, these letters are from the archive at the O'Keefe Museum. O'Keefe declined, saying she was busy with other projects and, quote, quite tired of publicity. O'Keefe, while O'Keefe was often involved in conservation projects privately, such as donating thousands of dollars to national conservation organizations such as the Sierra Club, by the late 1970s, the archival material such as this suggests that she preferred to donate privately rather than participate in public efforts such as the Greenpeace poster series. Her participation in the 1971 Save Our Planet series is thus an example of her public association with conservation that became more rare later in her career. Finally, uh, Lippmann herself wrote to O'Keefe in 1971 saying, quote, Dear Miss O'Keefe, just wanted to say how fine I think the Save Our Planet, Save Our Air poster looks. And thanks for cooperating in this project. I'm very happy with the entire series, and I'm sure your part in this message will carry a great deal of weight. 
Sincerely, Jean Lippman. So my presentation today really traced the path of my research from learning more about O'Keeffe's oeuvre and the series of aerial landscapes to analyzing the Save Our Air print more deeply before exploring the diplomatic function of the Save Our Planet series and communicating a message of environmental conservation. My research is really the first to analyze O'Keeffe's print in the context of her career and study the series and draw out the ways in which Lippmann leveraged the works of famous American artists to um, present a message of gl a global aspirational and political message of conservation rather than advocating for a specific solution to pollution. Um, I definitely have more information about the series and other uh, primary material examples, such as articles and photos. So I would love to hear your thoughts and questions about this work. Um, but thank you really for engaging in this talk with me. And I hope my research has helped to expand your understanding of O'Keeffe. Thank you so much. This was really enlightening and just fascinating material for us to hear, um, you know, O'Keeffe's efforts towards this environmental cause are just fascinating. Um, we did have a couple questions that came through in the chat. Um, first, are you able to speak to what type of materials O'Keeffe used to create her print? Yes, so this is uh, an offset lithograph. Um, so I actually had the chance to, when I went into the Yale Art Gallery, to view this work, um, really see it up close and see the weave of the paper and touch it a little bit. Um, and which I've missed a lot, not being able to, to be in museums for more than a year and a half. And when you're physically examining this work up close, the paper has a kind of heft to it. So it's, it's heavier than your normal printing paper, um, but not so heavy that it's inflexible. So it can still bend. Um, and th this was the, that, that type of paper was what the prints that were gifted to the, to the United Nations would have been printed on. But you could actually write into magazines and buy a version of this print for yourself. So for five or ten dollars, you could have your own uh, O'Keeffe print uh, in your home, which would have been printed on a little bit more less expensive paper. So probably of a cheaper quality. And I saw someone in the chat at the beginning and said they had they said they had one of these original prints, um, which is which one do you have? <laughs> and that's very cool. Um, so that, that's kind of the materiality. I don't know to what extent O'Keeffe was involved in the printing of the process by 1971. It's pretty late in her career. Um, and given kind of the tone with which she answers the letters, it seems like she's mostly involved in perhaps choosing the typography um, and obviously allowing Lippmann to use this specific composition. But I think uh, Lippmann would have had greater agency in choosing the kind of material um, that the work was printed on. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of folks who've popped up in the chat who've mentioned that they have a copy of some type. Um, do you know anything about a little bit more about those reproductions or how many were produced? Mm -hmm. That's a really fascinating part of the series that is really hard to find research on because these a couple thousand reproductions of this print were produced for public consumption and those um that profit was supposed to be donated donated excuse me donated to unicef efforts of child welfare in africa asia and latin america so we have a poster series that's oriented towards anti-pollution efforts but the money going towards child welfare programs um, and I really haven't been able to find like if that money ended up going there, how it was used. So that seemed kind of like a, a black hole in terms of um, that aspect of the series. Um, but otherwise, uh, reproductions were also displayed um, were also displayed around the world. So because Lippmann was the director of publications at the Whitney Museum, uh, these a set of these prints was don were donated to the museum and displayed there. And they were also displayed at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And Lippmann actually received a few postcards uh, from people who had seen that exhibition, who wrote to her saying, love the exhibition in London, can you send me the Calder print? Which again, I think points to uh, 
the power that these artists had because the people who wrote those letters aren't saying, can you send me the wildlife print? They're saying, can you send me the Calder print? So specifically remembering uh, that, that message of conservation as related to the artist um, himself. Late breaking question. Um, someone has asked, did O'Keefe participate in any other commissioned series or group projects to your knowledge? Mm -hmm. Those, she was really involved in those um, exhibitions that I mentioned during the Cold War, kind of the 1946 Advancing American Art Exhibition. And then her work was again displayed at the 1956 Venice Biennial, which also had kind of um, propaganda efforts in terms of kind of ser series, I think her work was also used for um, an orchestra in New Mexico, uh, maybe the Santa Fe Music Festival, has, her work has been kind of used as the image of that music festival for many years. But towards the end of her career, she was especially uh, reluctant to participate in more of those series publicly. Um, so much for your time this is really fascinating thank you so very much we, thank we you be here with us yeah thank you so much for hosting me and for everyone for engaging and asking questions have a great day everyone